Hello and welcome to Rogue Artisans and Crafters, winner of the 2018 Southern Oregon Television Awards for Best Arts and Culture Show. I'm your host, David Glamour Dave Ninow. We welcome you, our viewer, to our show where we feature local artists and craftspeople here in Southern Oregon. And we talk to our featured artists about how they came to their art, what drives them as artists, find out stories behind their art, their art process, and how their work as artists influences their lives. Today, we are privileged to feature local artist William S. Phillips. Bill Phillips is internationally known for his aviation art. His career spans over four decades, and his work has influenced numerous other aviation artists and helped to define the field of aviation art itself. As a young boy, Bill Phillips was the first artist that I personally became aware of when my parents and I would have lunch at the Red Baron Lounge at the Mefford Airport, where his work was first displayed. With such long admiration of Bill's art, I will confess to the audience that having Bill uh, on the show to talk to him about his life and work is an exciting moment for me. Because of Bill's length of career and his accomplishments, we are making this show a two-part interview. Bill is only the third artist I have featured on the show to have a two-part interview, but it is well-deserved to really tell Bill's story. And so today, we will talk to William S. Phelps about his life as an artist and the work that he pursues today with his art. And so we welcome Bill to the show. David, thanks for having me. Oh, I'm glad. Pleasure. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing for me because I've been uh, a fan of your work since uh, seeing it at the Red Baron Lounge when I was about 10 years old. <laughs> so that means this is take like a long uh, path for the both of us to come together. Easy does it. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I'm honored to have you here and to talk about your work. Absolutely. And just to let the audience know, <clears throat> you know, with, the, with the, all the forest fires going on and all the smoke in the valley, if Bill and I go into a coughing fit, it is because of that. So, yes. Yes. <laughs> so uh, to begin with, my understanding is that, uh, that you started, uh, your love for aviation started when you were pretty young. That's correct. Uh, one of my first memories, in fact, was as a, I had to pre be maybe one and a half years old, laying on a lawn, looking up at a beautiful blue sky, huge puffy white cumulus, and a little yellow airplane, and this was in Culver City, California, where, uh, where we lived at the time. And uh, it, I was just enthralled by the, the experience, and I remember to, do, to this day what it looked like. Yeah. But uh, no, I moved through uh, a, a number of experiences with aviation. My father was an actor uh, on, under contract with uh, MGM, and he worked on the movie 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. Oh, okay, yeah. And I came around later in life and had a very strong connection with the Tokyo Raiders. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting because I always kidded that my father was probably too close to some of the airplanes when they were starting up <laughs> and I was in the womb. Yeah, right. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, uh, eventually, I mean, at a certain point in your youth, you really kind of took to, to exploring art and taking that interest in the aviation. That's correct. Uh, we moved out to the San Fernando Valley and uh, I ended up in uh, Catholic school, Our Lady of Peace. It was almost anything but. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a sister. I had a nun by the name of Sister Regina, uh -huh. and I couldn't stand to see anything blank. Uh -huh. So when I would finish a, a test, I'd turn it over and draw something. <laughs> okay. And somewhere around the fourth grade, she brought me up in front of the class, and she wagged her finger in front of my nose, and she said, "Billy Phillips." You're never going to amount to anything if you keep this up. <laughs> at which point I smiled at her uh -huh. and uh, paid no attention. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, one of the things that's interesting is that I didn't realize that my, my father graduated from um, George Washington University, and he was, a, he was a good student. And before he went into theater, he took a lot of math courses. And one of the things that's really troubling when I was young was the fact that I wanted to be um, a naval aviator uh -huh. from the time I could remember. And I could never get mathematics down. I was totally mathematically challenged. Yeah, yeah. And the thing that uh, bothered me most was when I it was in junior high school, and I realized I was never going to be a fighter pilot because you had to know math and yeah, physics. Yeah. Uh, so that that was a very troubling experience. And my dad died when I was twelve. Mm, okay. And I took a very hard turn. My we couldn't afford the Catholic school anymore. We went to public school. And it was down in Los Angeles, and I took a hard turn in the wrong direction. Mm. And the art kind of took a second, second place to that. My mother moved us up to Silverton, Oregon in 1962. And uh, I had two teachers, and teachers are extremely important in a young person's life. Yeah. I had a fellow by the name of Mr. Barnes who taught algebra for me for the third time around my sophomore year. 
And he noticed that I was, what I was doing was that I was transposing my numbers completely. So he worked with me, and he got me to the point where instead of failing, I was getting Bs. Oh, okay. And at the same time, I had a lady by the name of Mrs. Asbury who started noticing that I could draw. Mm -hmm. And she put me in a special, I went through, within the second month of being at Silverton High School, I was in a special uh, class for gifted st students. Yeah. And I started doing commercial work by the time I was a junior. Wow. And nice. so that's, it, it, it really took off at that point. Yeah. But. Yeah. And uh, now at a certain point, uh, you, you made the move to Southern Oregon. You made the move down here to Ashland. Somewhat yeah. later. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and my understanding is that while you were kind of still kind of doing your art, you became a firefighter with, with the city of Ashland. I did. Yeah. And we need to back up just a little bit because when I went, I, Went to Vietnam in 65, mm -hmm. and I've always been enamored with huge skies, beautiful cumulus clouds, and I saw some of the best I've ever seen in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And even though there was a war in progress, there was a lot of beauty in that country yeah. as well. And I've talked to another, a number of Vietnam vets that say the same thing. I brought a sketchbook with me, and I sketched on the, I worked at night the whole time I was over there, but I had a sketchbook and I would go out on the flight line because it was so blasted hot, mm -hmm. you couldn't sleep past noon. Yeah. And I started sketching the flight lines. Well, I lost that in transit back, mm -hmm. which was, that was really kind of too bad because it was some good stuff. But I went on to uh, work down in Los Angeles for a while when I got out of the airport, Air, Air Force, and um, I ended up on the freeway. I was taking some uh, off-campus classes with UCLA. I was late for a biology class, stuck in traffic. And I had wanted to be an attorney. Uh -huh. I figured that was the way my career was going to go. And uh, I was sitting in a Volkswagen on the freeway trying to get over the mountain to go to uh, UCLA. And I thought to myself, you know, even if you do well in law and you go to a law firm, you're going to be owning the same piece of real estate. You just won't be driving a Volkswagen. You'll be driving a Mercedes maybe. <laughs> and I said, something's got to change here. Yeah. That's when I came up to Southern Oregon uh -huh. in the same Volkswagen. And I... I was on the GI Bill, so I had money to pay for tuition and books, but very little past that. Yeah. And I had set in my mind that I'd go ahead and um, sleep in the Volkswagen, shower, and use the gymnasium, and study at the library. Mm -hmm. And then I went into the uh, placement office, work placement, and, at, and they said, we've got a program you might be interested in. It's called, it's called the sleeper program with the Ashland Fire. I said, sleeper, I can do that. <laughs> I, I can excel at that. So uh, I went ahead and went down. Chief Robel uh, was the chief at the time. He hired me on the spot. I got the outstanding sum of a dollar a run, uh -huh. and I had to make every run and have a big old plectron that I carried to all my classes. And when it would go off, I was expected to leave class and uh -huh. join up with, with the fire department. Yeah. But that was during the that was a period where I started. I met my wife in that period, Christy, mm -hmm. and I started drawing again, yeah. and really got involved in it. And so that's kind of where we take me to. Yeah. SOU. And so eventually, then at a certain point, you you got your art at the Medford uh, Airport Red Baron Lounge, yes. right? That's and like that, early seventies. That's correct. Yeah. Nineteen seventy-two was when I actually it was yeah seventy-two. Yeah. And I. Um, I did four very bad paintings, and have, if I was myself now telling me at the same time, I just said, son, don't quit your day job. It's terrible. But they went up, and I was pounding the fourth one into the wall in the bar there, uh -huh. and somebody behind me said, are those for sale? And I turned around, and I said, yeah. He said, how much do you want? I said, $25 a piece. Uh -huh. And he said, done. He said, I want you to do, do two more for me, uh -huh. and help me get this in the airplane so I can take it up to home. So I packed him up, he gave me a check for $100, and for $100, I turned my whole life around, yeah. told my wife of six months, I'm not going to be an attorney, I'm going to give this, avi this aviation art stuff a try. Yeah. And on that, that kind of turned my life in another direction, and the, I, I learned an interesting lesson, though. He said he wanted two more, and I did two more, uh -huh. and I mailed them to him, uh -huh. and I didn't get the cash up front. So if you're still out there, <laughs> you still owe me 50 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was about 1973 when I was about 10 uh -huh. when uh, my parents and I would go out to the Red Baron Lounge for lunch. And that's when I just saw your art on display there. Uh, I, I distinctly remember a portrait of the Red Baron and some other yes. paintings out there. 
and uh, and so in a way, you're kind of like kind of like the first artist that I consciously became aware of as a kid, and and have been an admirer of your work ever mm -hmm. since. So uh, so yeah, you've you've got a, a long time uh, fan from uh -huh. here, you know, but. Uh, uh, but you've done so much since then. I mean, you've really had a, a really uh, oh, amazing career. It has been a blessed career. I mean, over 40 years of doing what I could never have, have dreamed of. Uh, it, I had a dear friend back in L.A. He was a friend of my father's, his accountant. And he said, Billy, when you grow up, what do you want to be? I said, I want to be a policeman, a fireman. I want to fly airplanes, and I want to draw pic pictures. Yeah done every one of them yeah well and it's been uh it's been phenomenal in that um the way i set out to do it was to figure that i wanted aviation art not as commercial work but as fine art in galleries yeah and at the time that was a hard sell yeah. my first gallery experience was soaring wings gallery up in salem oregon mm -hmm. bruce watkins was the owner and i approached him and i said uh i'd like to do aviation and he said nah he said what else do you do well, birds. I figured, you know, wings up, wings down. Yeah. How many ways can you paint a duck? It's all aeronautical. Yeah, right. So I went ahead and I started doing Upland and Wetland Game Birds. And on one of the shows, I always showed up with my, my portfolio of aviation. And at the time, my price range was about $450. Uh -huh. And a fellow came up to me and he said, uh, I saw your portfolio. He said, I'd like to commission you to do a piece. And he said, I'd like it. And he gave me the size. And I said, he said, what would you charge me? I said, 1200 bucks." Uh -huh. And, he, and I, he said, sure. Yeah. And I said, go see the man over there. Yeah. So he went over and he talked to Bruce. And Bruce looks over at me and um, we had a dinner afterwards, an artist dinner. And Bruce, he sat, ne sat me next to him at the table. And he, we were about halfway through the salad and he looked over and he said, uh, Bill, about this aviation stuff. <laughs> and away we went from that point. Yeah. 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 Well, now uh, we've got some pictures of your of mm -hmm. your life that uh, that you gave uh, to to that we can talk about. So, if the uh, control room could bring up those uh, uh, those photos, and we'll kind of begin to kind of talk about uh, about those. Yeah. There we go. That's your uh, your. That's parents. my mother and my father. Yeah. And uh, like I say, my father was in 97 movies. Yeah, wow. Uh, I had a chance when we were living out in the valley to meet a number of people that were involved in Hollywood. And one of the people that I met was, there was a family friend, was Jimmy Durante. Oh, okay. And uh, I remember, I was very young, but I remember sitting on his lap. Yeah. And my dad had told me, he has a very large nose. <laughs> and I, can, I just remember just staring at his nose. Yeah, right, yeah. But he was a, he was a great guy. But no, being around that, uh, my mom was instrumental and in, when I got into trouble in Los Angeles when I figured my life was over after my dad passed away and there was no real discipline yeah. there anymore uh, she managed to move us up to Silverton Oregon yeah and I'll give the lady a lot of credit for for guts because she yeah. left all of her family all of her friends down there and took my sister and myself up to uh, Silverton Oregon yeah. you talk about culture shock I yeah. left a high school that was 4,000 students Got into one that was 600 students. Yeah, so. right. Yeah, that's a big. And yeah. turned the clock back to the 1800s. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, let's uh, go on to the next uh, picture. And uh, and uh, this was I was uh, I was commissioned by Northrop Corporation. Five artists were commissioned to go to Saudi Arabia, and to paint uh, pictures of the Northrop aircraft in their inventory. Mm. Two of us were on flying status. Myself and another artist by the name of Attila Hedja. And he was from New York. He was a New York uh, illustrator. And uh, it was an interesting experience because we had carte blanche for a month to see the entire country. Oh, wow. And they were broken up into my, a fellow by the name of Marbury Hill, who was a fashion illustrator in New York. And he was a, he was a great character. And uh, we, had a, we had a marvelous time in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Uh, it was an interesting culture at the time. It's, it's changing somewhat. But... It was a very restrictive culture, yeah. and I got a chance to see it. Yeah. Now let's go on to the next uh, image. Now this is a letter. Yes. From Governor Straub. Governor Bill Straub, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And uh, and that that um, I had a show during the Soaring Wings experience when I was just uh, flexing my muscles more or less in the art art world, and the governor's office saw some of my some of my work at Soaring Wings. 
and said, we'd love to feature some of your work. And they featured aviation, bird art, and also um, what I called at the time, Oregon's Great Mountains. Mm -hmm. And that was a very successful um, series of paintings, yeah. by the way. But you know, that was uh, featured there at the governor's office. And it ran, I think, for about a month. Yeah. And Christy and I took that entire show up to the governor's office in the same Volkswagen that I had moved up here. <laughs> yeah, okay. Tight squeeze. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's go on to the next. Yeah. Okay. 40 years of high performance flight, had to give it up three years ago because of a broken uh, neck and oh, wow. uh, couldn't pull G's anymore. But this was down in Randolph Field in Texas. Um, I, I got a flight in the T-38 and they knew after a while that I, I was not new to this rodeo. Uh -huh. And the particular pilot on this flight said, Bill, I'm not gonna go out and just do turns. What do you wanna do? He said, I wanna learn, I said, I wanna learn to do aerobatics. Let's go out and do it. Yeah. And it was a great ride, yeah. great ride that day. Yeah. Great, yeah. And let's go on to the next. In the career, one of the, art has been the vehicle to get me into history. Yeah. And some of the people that I've met have been just rock stars. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet General Jimmy Doolittle from the Tokyo Raiders, mm -hmm. and this is where we go back to my father being in that movie. I had done a lecture and pre presented um, the Tuskegee University, one of my paintings, mm -hmm. uh, at the Smithsonian, and I'd gone to their IMAX there and done the presentation. My agent at the time, Virginia Botter, and uh, my, uh, the vice president of the uh, Greenwich Workshop, um, went to a place called the Orleans Restaurant, and Virginia said, Bill, if you could do any painting in the world, what would it be? And I said, I'd love to do a painting of Jimmy Doolittle with all the Raiders and have everybody sign that painting. And I said, logistically, however, that would be impossible. And, uh, Charlie Rudy, who was the vice president, looked over and he said, no, it's not. He said, Greenwich will foot the bill for the whole thing if you can get an interview with uh, Doolittle. Virginia said, I know Doolittle's secretary, Donna. She said, can you delay your flight back to, uh, back to the, the West Coast for a day? This was in the day mm. when we could do that on yeah. the spur of the moment. And I said, sure, let's do it. So she called her, I got an interview, and we were off and running with Jimmy Doolittle. I had dinner with him, talked about early aviation, yeah. the raid, and, uh, so the picture that you just saw was a grouping, Robin Old, some, some of the people from World War II. And this, I met, I met so many people, uh, Johnny Johnson, Vice Air Marshal uh, uh, Johnny Johnson, uh, Bob Stanford Tuck, a whole list of people that were just absolute luminaries uh, in the field of aviation that I'd read about in history books. Yeah. So it was marvelous. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and let's go to one more. And uh... Uh, Top Gun. Yeah. The movie came out, Top Gun. Now, Christy and I, I drug her to that f nine showings. <laughs> Went from the full price down to a dollar. And uh, by the end of it, I called it training. Yeah. Because they called me a month after and they said, we'd like you to go down and, and uh, research and then do a series of paintings for the Navy on Top Gun. Yeah. So I went down there, I went aboard the Kitty, um, the Kitty Hawk uh, for the carrier. I was on several different ships and I got a chance to go through their Top Gun school. Wow. To do that, I had, to, I had to go th through all their swim schools and devices courses. I'm not the greatest swimmer in the world. <laughs> yeah. And Christy and I would fill up, I took a hunting vest, put bricks in the back of it, put my boots on, my flight suit, went out to Immigrant Lake, strolled out into the lake, and then for 35 minutes tried to stay afloat with uh -huh. all the weight. And I swear there were people out there that were watching me go into the water with her watching and thinking, I'll bet she's got an insurance policy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> Well, you, but you know, you got to do what you got to do. You got to do what you got to do. And by the way, a couple of old guys uh, down there for the swim school, I went through the entire swim school. They told me I, they weren't going to pull any punch. They weren't going to give me any spares. At over 40 years old, I went there through their swim school and passed it. Yeah. We went out and had a couple of brewskis that night. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it'd be well deserved. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, let's go on to uh, one more. And uh... These are the Raiders. Yeah. This was in Washington, D.C., the, the general and most of them have passed at this point. Yeah, right. And these folks, uh, I've done a number of paintings with the Raiders over the years. Uh, this was the last five alive. The fellow to my immediate, uh, as you're looking at it, my left, but on my yeah. right as I'm looking out, is Dick Cole. And Dick is still alive. He's 103 years old. Wow. And he can still, when I go out and uh, 
do research with him or if I'm out on the road with doing shows, that man, I'm, I'm saying good night at 11.30 at night. He's saying, you know, where's the next group of people I can party with? Yeah, right. <laughs> so there's something to be said about having that lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, we're getting kind of near the end, and I want to kind of showcase a few of your aviation art pieces. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if the control room could bring up uh, uh, the first uh, uh, image of aviation art. Now, this has been one of my all-time favorites. This, this is a painting called Phantoms and the Wizard, and I flew out of Kingsley Field uh, to do this. It took about three months to get permission from the Department of Interior and the Forest Service to do an overflight at the altitude we wanted to do it. Yeah. And we came out, we went up the Oregon coast, uh, we came back in from the north, and we had two runs. We went uh, north to south, came out to the east past Mount Scott, rolled back in, and came over, and one of the airplanes I was in, we rolled to the top of the formation and shot down. And it was the weirdest sensation, shooting out of the top of the canopy, looking back, back at that lake, it was crystal clear. So it made it feel like you were actually, you, it was disorienting. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's but it's an amazing piece. And uh, let's go on to the next painting. Blue Angels. Oh, uh, nice. I've flown with both the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels, and the Blue Angels was a great experience. And I don't know if we've got time, but it's it was the closest I've come to the possibility of an ejection. Yeah. We went out, uh, did a, the whole thing, max performance climb. Went out over the Gulf. Uh, did our thing, and then uh, while we were, he said, well, he let me fly it for a while, and I, he had said, I've got the aircraft. And as we started back, he said, well, we're gonna head on back to Pensacola. He, those words never, no more than got out of his mouth. Then he said, uh, the, the warning came on that we had an engine problem. Yeah. And we motored on back, landed. I, was, I got my, all my gear secured in case I had to eject, but no problems until we, we got on the ground and we egressed on the first taxiway and they said, you know, out of the plane, you're leaking fuel all over the, all over the runway. Oh, wow. So we had had a major fuel break. Oh. Well, uh, let's bring up, can we bring up uh, Thunder in the Canyon? There we go. Now, this is another one of my favorites. Uh, and you're, you, the Grand Canyon is a common theme in a lot of your work. It so, is. It's, yeah. it's huge. I've been uh, associated with the Grand Canyon hiking it and rafting it for, since early 1980. Yeah. And uh, this was the, an interesting deal in that we couldn't fly low through the canyon like I show it here. Right, yeah. But I did fly with them. Uh, I flew in the formation and then I went and one of the F-16 F units gave me a ride and we went over the canyon and we got out to a place called Hermit's Rest and he said, you want to see the canyon like nobody's seen it before? And he rolled upside down. Oh my and I got gosh. some incredible pictures of the canyon just inverted, and then we rolled yeah. out at Desert View and came back into Nellis. Wow, that's, that sounds like an amazing experience. Oh, it was. Yeah. And they're a great group of guys. I mean, just all of them are superb. Well, the thing that's, that strikes me about your, your life and, and, and what, what your art has, has uh, done for you is to give you such an amazing uh, variety of life experiences that are uniquely... Uh, singular in terms of what they relate to, to, to the work that you do, you know, and True. that's got to be an amazing uh, thing. Yes, yeah. it really is. Um, like I, I tell people, you know, I'm, I've been so blessed in life and uh, I actually do, I give God, God the credit. I, my life changed in 75 when I became a Christian. I was yeah. an agnostic till then and doors have opened just interestingly, yeah. let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, let's bring up one of the other paintings, uh, Throne Room of God. Yeah. Nice segue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, this was, I was not flying in an F-14. I was flying in an F-15. But it was a gray, gloomy, miserable day. Mm -hmm. And towards evening, and we were motoring on back to the base, and we punched through into one of the most magnificent things I've seen in my career in aviation. We were between towering cumulus clouds. They were all the way around us except for one area where the sun was going down, and it reflected everything in gold. And within probably 40 seconds, we had popped back and back into the gray. But I remembered yeah. this. I didn't have a, I didn't have a camera, mm -hmm. but I did remember it and put that down. And it, I got that painting done in about uh, three days, which is, for me, impossible. Uh, it's, I don't ever work that fast. But yeah. it, well, I would say that there's a deep inspiration that brought oh, yeah. drove you in that, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. Uh, let's go on to the next. There's uh, Advantage Eagle. There we go. Advantage Eagle. That was uh, Luke Air Force Base, and uh, I was one of the first artists asked to go down there when they were testing the F-15. Yeah. And to tell you to what extent I am sliding inexorably into decrepitude, the antique or the F-15 is now being phased out of the service. Yeah. Same, same me. <laughs> Well, I think you probably still got a lot of art in you, and that's something that that, that is, I mean, you've done a, an enormous amount of body of work. Uh, yes, uh, I I never I didn't keep track, but uh, I would say all told, well over two thousand pieces. Yeah, wow, that's a lot. Well, Bill, we're coming to the end of the first segment, and so I thank you for that, and we're going to continue on. Uh, so let me just wrap this up here, and we'll say that. Uh, we've reached the end of our show, Rogue Artisans and Crafters. Uh, we thank you at home for joining us and learning about our featured artist, William S. Phillips. We wish to thank Bill Phillips for agreeing to come on to the show to discuss his life as an artist. Be sure to catch the second part of this interview where we continue to discuss his work beyond the aviation art to explore his themes of nostalgia, seascapes, lighthouses, and the Grand Canyon. I encourage you, the viewer, to visit Bill's official sites of his authorized dealers to see more of his work and to purchase his prints and original art. So I'm your host, David Glamour Dave Ninau, and we will see you next time. We wish to thank you for watching Rogue Artisans and Crafters. You can watch this program on demand by visiting rvtv.sou.edu and clicking on the public access link. You can also follow our show on Facebook by visiting and liking our official show page. You can follow me, David Glamour Dave Nenow, online at my YouTube channel and on Facebook. Just search for David Nenow or Glamour Dave. If you like this show and wish to support me in my show productions at RVTV, you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash Glamour Dave. Your patron support helps me with my production expenses, allows me to reward my crews for all their hard work, and allow me the opportunity to continue to produce more unique themed shows and documentaries for you, the viewer. You can watch this show on Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. and Thursday evenings at 11.30 p.m. We want to thank our crew who have made it possible to put this program together and to thank RVTV for their wonderful studio facility, which allows us to produce shows such as this one.